hello everyone. Welcome back after our break. I have Jesse here. He's my longtime friend from Scrum Alliance, one of our crowd. And he has something super exciting for you today, which is about his book called Untapped Agility. So I'm curious about what is that about? So Jesse, up to you. Hi, everybody. Greetings from Washington, DC, where I'm just about middle of the day here for us. Uh, I'm so excited to be a part of this global event. We've already heard some great speakers giving some great uh, thoughts and concepts about what agility could look like and where uh, some, whether it's um, in sales or whether large scale scrum can help an organization evolve uh, into a better version of itself. And so I'm excited to share with you guys about the journey. Uh, it's super important to have a vision of the destination but then the pathway to getting there can be really challenging. And so that, ladies and gentlemen, is what untapped agility is all about. It's about finding the potential, the excellence, the collaboration, the creativity that is right there. It's right there. And we know we're going for that over the course of a multi-year journey. But sometimes it can be hard. It can be really hard. And so this is uh, the, um, a, a little bit of a, a sneak preview, a little bit of a taste of what is in the book. Uh, super excited to share this story with everybody who was willing to listen. So uh, let me share a little bit. Uh, this is the key message. If you learn only one thing, learn this. Your transformation is not a failure. It has only just begun. As we are trying to move our teams and our, our departments and our products into more modern ways of working, more collaboration, more creativity, more quality, uh, more morale and engagement, we're trying to move this. It can be really frustrating when things don't go according to plan. When we have a vision of maybe next month we'll, we'll have uh, more velocity or next month we'll have fewer defects or next month will always be a little bit better. But then there's always so many frustrating barriers and it can be really discouraging. And my note to you, all of you who are champions of better ways of working is you are not alone. <laughs> this is hard work, moving a team, a product, a, a program for organization from current state to future state is tough leadership work. So what do we do? How do we make forward? Uh, how do we move forward? Uh, a little bit about myself, just to let you know where I'm coming from. I have had the privilege of doing this agile work in a variety of countries and a variety of industries and have helped introduce this to project managers in the Project Management Institute, uh, to innovators, and the uh, Agile Alliance, and that's what the uh, the Agile Practice Guide was about. I had the privilege to work on that with some people, and and I do work as a coach in also in the virtual space. So I've had I've had the uh, opportunity to ask people, "How's it going? How are you doing? What barriers are you running into? How have you gotten along?" So here, ladies and gentlemen, is the uh, the agenda. I want to tell you a quick story and share with you how that story fits into an overarching pattern of recurring barriers. And then I'll show you another story about how that, um, that pattern uh, applies to our practices. And then I'll offer you some, uh, some, uh, some resources. Another key message here is that this journey of moving past uh, barriers to better ways of working to more agility is for leaders of every level. You do not need a fancy job title. You do not need to be vice president or CEO or agile coach. You could be Ted the team lead, who might be a team member who's very senior expertise and lots of influence, or Maria the manager, who maybe does have some authority and some budget, or 
Emmett, the executive, who is the visionary who wants to implement Agile and implement DevOps across the whole organization by December. And the story here applies to any of these Agile champions. Because on this conference today, we have people at different levels of the organization. We have some senior leaders listening in, we have some middle managers, and we have team leads and practitioners. So pay, atten uh, pay attention to the parts that resonate with you and keep in mind that you are not alone. You might be like Luis. Luis was asked to join into a company, a media company here in the US, who had a season of creative explosion. They had a CEO who was the most creative CEO they ever had, who filmed lots of TV episodes and uh, initiated a new mobile app and uh, initiated lots of good online articles about uh, their topics. And it was, it was so creative, lots of ideas, and it burned people out. That mobile app was not creating any revenue. Those TV episodes that they filmed were not being broadcast. And with all of these ideas being thrown around, everyone was being pulled onto this project and then this project and then that project. As soon as I start a project, here comes a new request. Here comes a new, th and everyone was frustrated. And when they were growing, they were adding more people on at different salaries and different titles. And it was so confusing and people were angry. And the ownership was angry because it was starting to impact the bottom line. So they asked Luis, who was a consultant, and they said, can you, uh, can you come in and, and help fix this? We've, uh, the CEO has resigned and we need uh, a new leader to come in and help clean this up a little bit. And when he looked at the problems, which was too much uh, development meant too much technical debt. Too many projects meant that there was no progress. Too many, too much hiring, too fast meant that there was dis, um, inconsistencies in, in, in the organization. And uh, with respect to uh, titles and job descriptions and compensation and things. And it's just a long list of all of these problems. It was almost like, a backlog. And so the question is, where do I begin in my transformation? And he chose a different strategy than his predecessor, the CEO. The CEO was very good about seizing opportunities and starting things. And he said, mm, we need to only do a few things. We're going to do a few new agile practices. We're not going to hire a new chief product owner yet. We don't, we're not going to define a new vision yet. We have other work to do in the short term. We can't do the other things uh, that are going to take longer time. And his employees were unhappy. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, we need someone to be in charge. We need someone to fix this organization issue. We need someone to fix the technical debt. We need to all right now. So some people just left, but over time, things started to heal one step at a time. So this is a common pattern where most change champions, most uh, agile champions, DevOps champions want to seize the opportunities. Ooh, there's a new pilot project. Let's go do that pilot project. Ooh, new pilot project over here. Ooh, new tool. Let's install a new tool. Ooh, a new stakeholder who likes agile. Let's see. And so, uh, and if I'm working on this initiative, I should also maybe include this other stakeholder and I should also include this new uh, feature and include um, all of this because we need to catch up. We need to move. Let's go. And this is a good move. This is about taking initiative. It's about um, creating momentum. But it only can take us so far before we're always behind, overcommitted over allocated, fragmented, working on so many things and making progress on only a few things. And so this good idea, this leadership strategy of seizing opportunities has some side effects where you can have too much of a good thing. And that's the barrier to further progress. So what do we do? We rebound past the barrier 
by saying no. Master the art of no. And that's what Luis did. He said no to this change and no to this change and no to this change so that he could focus on only two or three changes. And all it did was work. So when it comes to mastering no, what does that mean, Jesse? What are we talking about here? And there's three dimensions. The question is, should we deliver every feature that everyone asks for on our products? For every product, every and the answer of no. That's why we have the, the discipline and the, 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 the capacity and competency of product ownership, product ownership, product management. It's about making economic choices. Instead of do, building everything, we only build the right things. Should we transform everything all at once? Uh, that big bang transformation. There are some in our community, there are some who believe in agility that the best way to do it is complete reorganization, top to bottom, all at once. And some organizations can do that, but most, that creates burnout. It creates uh, uh, conflict and toxicity. And so we should not transform everything at once. And then should you, the agile expert, the agile champion, the one who gets it, should, should you be involved in every meeting to make sure that people do the right thing? And the answer is no, because then you, your influence is diluted across so many things that you can only make so much influence on a few things. No is the secret to momentum. When you get to too much, so then how do we decide? Okay, if, if we should only do some Agile, where should we do it? And this graphic here from the Harvard Business Review is called the Innovation Ambition Matrix. And it makes the case that in your day-to-day -day operations, your everyday core uh, business outcomes and business uh, processes, and your, maybe that's where your chief revenue is, comes from, your cash cow, uh, there's not a lot of uncertainty. This is, you know where to play and you know how to win. And if there's not a lot of uncertainty, we only need some agility there. But we need a little bit more agility if we're starting to add a new market, a new stakeholder community, and maybe add a new product or a new feature set to an existing stakeholder community or an existing market. Those are adjacent innovations. There we need a little bit more agility because we have some unknowns and some uncertainty and some ambiguity. Or the transformational uh, items that we're working on. We're trying a completely new thing that we haven't done before. Well, we need more agility there to probe and experiment and learn and adapt. Uh, and the science, uh, the research rather, uh, in this article said that each organization should have its own blend of investments. So you should not spend 100% of your money in only the core business, you'll never innovate. Nor should you spend 100% only in transformational items because only some of them will yield fruit. What is the right proportion of investment? And on average, 70% of the core, 20% adjacent, 10% transformational is the average, but your business might be different than the average. The key point here is do not transform everything all at once. It's a guaranteed way to make, uh, to, to make a lot of people angry and to meet a lot of resistance and to impact more boundaries and to dilute your influence and dilute your momentum. Choose your battles. Choose where to invest your transformation energy. Choose where agility is needed first and then move from there. So that's the first pattern. That's the first rebound move. The pattern, ladies and gentlemen, is where we start first by seizing opportunities. It's an excellent leadership move. Change agents need to do that. At some point, however, if you seize too much, you're gonna start falling behind on your commitments. You're gonna start falling behind on people's aspirations and hopes for agility. You're not going to see the moment. They're not going to see the momentum they hope for. So the rebound to get past overcommitment and delays and being behind the rebound is to start saying no. Many of us know this as limiting whip. Many of us know this as focus, stop starting, start finishing. Some of us know about this as prioritization. 
but at the end of the day, uh, as change champions, it means saying no to things that we really want because there are some things that we need first. And this is the overarching pattern behind the concept of untapped agility. The concept here is that whatever we do to get started on our journey towards more agility and more digital capability and more innovation, on that journey, whatever we do is the boost to get started. And then some point, we hit a barrier. And that barrier slows us down. It holds us back. And the only way forward is with the rebound, where we lean against the logic of the boost by doing something very different. So instead of seizing opportunities to get more momentum, more untapped agility, we need to do less of those opportunities and start saying no. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you might be asking, what are those barriers, Jesse? If uh, it sounds like you've got, uh, you've got, uh, some insight into what's going on with this stuff. So, uh, what do you, what do you, uh, what do you see? What are people saying? So, uh, our team did some research and took a look at several surveys across the industry over the last few years, and found some interesting patterns. And I bet you're wondering, what's the number one most common, most painful barrier to agility at scale? long term what you might it be if you were thinking that it was the culture and the structure you were in the most common uh response of all of the surveys the most common response is that our organizational culture and our organizational structure are slowing down agility where they're not letting us become more agile Another way of saying it is that our culture and our structure, that our organization is the barrier. The organization we're trying to evolve is itself in the way of that evolution. Another common thing is as change champions, we don't have enough resources. We don't have enough tooling, enough budget. We don't have enough training. We don't have enough people to help. Uh, we don't have enough expertise. Uh, we need more if we want to do more. In fact, we don't have enough leadership support. Number three, most common pattern is I don't have enough buy-in from middle management. I don't have enough buy-in from my peers and so on and so on and so on. And so what we did to, to craft the, the patterns in the, the seven leadership uh, patterns in the book is we picked out a few examples. Uh, around uh, how might we understand the path forward to the next level of agility, the next level of momentum. So we're going to, uh, we've highlighted a few examples of the limited impact. Our practices are poorly done and don't necessarily fit. People are snapping back to old habits. We're receiving unfair criticism. We've done so much, but everyone's still hating. So uh, these are the key barriers that people are saying. And then here are a few examples that we've talked about. Today, I've already shared with you one of the rebound moves past those barriers, mastering the art of no. These are the others. We have time to share one more. And that one is to throw the textbook away. What does that mean? What are you talking about? Throw the textbook away? Throw it? Uh, well, let's tell another story. Mike is the name of an agile champion. He was a transfer transformation leader at a publication company, a publisher where he was replacing the previous agile champion. And that previous agile champion, he used the scaled agile framework and, and it's, uh, many of us, uh, view that to be somewhat controversial. Some, uh, and, and he had his doubts about the scaled agile framework, safe. Ah. And so he came in and he started doing his research. And what he found was there was good progress. Hmm. That safe transformation created teams. We now had teams with lots of different skills on them instead of silos. Excellent job. We also had an aligned cadence. All the teams in this product were on two-week sprints. 
all the teams here, two week sprints, two week, and it created alignment. And they flattened the organization. There were fewer layers, fewer managers as a result of a scaled agile framework transformation. Not bad. But there was another problem because there were a lot of process police who said that you can't do this because the, the methodology says that we have to do it that way. And you can't do that because the methodology says we can't do it that way. And the people that were saying that were the scrum masters. They had become the process police because they felt their job, their title, scrum master, I am scrum master, we do scrum, we do it by the scrum guide, we do it according to the scale agile framework, we do it by the book, and that means you can't change or improve or do it different. Also, the product owners were saying, you may not talk to the team. I am the product owner. <laughs> talk to me. Uh, do not talk to the stakeholders. Do not talk to the customers, the users. No, no, no. I am the product owner. I talk to them. That's my title, product owner. The job titles were getting in the way of true collaboration and evolution. So he had an idea. Keep the people, remove the job titles. And all it did was work. Yes, initially there was a big confusion big what are, what are you doing i'm not a scrum master anymore what's my job what do I, I have a textbook that tells me my job is to do ask three questions in every scrum meeting every daily stand-up meeting i have the three questions now i don't what do i do and he said do what they need ask what do you need and then the product owners were confused. Wait, I owned this. This was mine. And now you're taking my title away. And now, well, you have to ask what your stakeholders need and enable more collaboration with the delivery teams. And over the time, uh, the course of time, there was an initial confusion and, and pushback. But over time, he challenged people to leverage their knowledge and then to evolve beyond their knowledge to application. And this is what we mean. So here's the pattern. If you're Ted the team lead and you love your Gherkin template, you love give and win then. Or Marie the manager, she loves her Kanban board and we're gonna do the Kanban board. And Emmett the executive, he likes the funding review boards from Lean Startup. And he says, that'll save us so much money. Let's do this. Let's install the best practices that we learned at the training seminar, at the conference, or at the uh, in the textbook that we read or bought and download it and it, let, let's do that. And that's an amazing idea because now we've introduced new concepts, new hope, new opportunity. We've, we've injected new creative thinking into the status quo. However, it can be really frustrating because they're doing it wrong. These user stories are horrible. These, these acceptance criteria are not what we're supposed to do. And, and what's the point of a Kanban board without whip limits? It's stale. And, and, and then the funding review boards were still approving every project. They're doing it wrong. It's so frustrating because they're figuring it out. Because that textbook process might not fit our reality perfectly. That practice may not make so much sense. So what do we do? Throw the textbook away. It's time to move on. Now that we've got the knowledge, now that we've got the concepts, we're running into a barrier where it's not fitting perfectly. It's not fitting well. So it's time to move beyond the baseline and into something better. Let's, uh, let's dig into this a little bit more because the challenge is that best practices often um, don't acknowledge reality. In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is a difference between theory and practice. So growth and context, let's talk about this. When it comes to growth, sometimes uh, when we're designing the new organization or we're designing the, the agile journey or we're designing the new uh, practices, uh, we, we spell it out. We have our playbook. We've got our team agreements and our team norms. We've written it all down, just like the Honda wrote down all the instructions for the 
uh, for, for their car here. They wrote down all the details about how it works and when to do this and how to do that. But then my teenage son, who's learning how to drive, is forgetting all of that when he tries to actually go in the car and he's, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. I'm just starting. I don't know how to do this. I'm figuring it out. So naturally, I'm going to do it poorly. And it's a good thing he has someone there to help him kind of uh, navigate. The, okay, yeah, I know the textbook says that you should do this, but um, actually there's a lot of traffic here right now. Let's maybe hold off on that. Because um, growth does not follow a perfect curve. Uh, most executives, they want to see the hockey stick. The hockey stick chart is where we, we move along and then uh, we success, excellence, awesomeness. But the reality is it follows a pattern called the J curve. And the J curve happens over and over again in, in the human experience. For example, in economics, you need to spend money before you make money. And in nation building, um, when we're trying to introduce more democracy into a country, we see less stability before over time we see more stability. And in personal psychology, uh, Virginia Satir was made famous when she adopted this curve by saying, you know, like, first, I'm going to um, try a, a new habit and maybe not do, uh, try breaking an old habit and not do so well. And over time, only do I start to see the results of breaking the habit. Um, maybe I stop drinking caffeine and I have withdrawal and then I feel healthier. Maybe I stop smoking and I have um, uh, side effects and then I start feeling more healthy. And the same is true with change. With change, we have our regular day to day and then we start doing agile. Scrum, DevOps, Lean Startup, and everyone is confused. Everyone's afraid. Everyone does it different. And over time, we start to improve. There's also the big point, which is new practices must be done poorly before they are done well. If it's new, you haven't mastered it. You have to do it poorly in order to get better. And sometimes as change agents, we forget this and we're so frustrated. We have not hit the end state yet. Okay, when will you guys have perfect estimation? Okay, when will you guys have zero defects? Come on. Uh, when will you start collaborating? No one is talking on this virtual call. Let's collaborate. Come. We forget it takes time is we want it so bad, because we're passionate about this stuff as change agents. Also, your context might be different than someone else's context. Here, the caterpillar is saying, I can't wait to see what kind of butterfly he turns into a beautiful butterfly. I'm a caterpillar, it'd be a butterfly, but it's not a butterfly. It looks like a butterfly inside the cage. It's actually a big snake. It looks the same, but it's a different context. And so sometimes we place our own expectations on other people when they come from a different background. They're a different industry, a different skill set, a different set of expectations. Your context as an Agile champion is different than an Agile beginner. So we have to be patient. We might even have to tailor our practices. Well, how can we tailor our practices? If we do that, then they won't work anymore. How can we tailor them and have them still work? So I'd like to share with you the 3P Agile tailoring approach. And that is that first, ask, acknowledge the pain that we're dealing with a practice and then ask what was the purpose, the value of the practice, and then ask how can we pivot or adjust the practice to capture some of that purpose while acknowledging the pain? I'll give an example. In this new virtual world where uh, no more face-to-face -face meetings, uh, if you're working on a global project with a lot of uh, non-native uh, English speakers, maybe there are a few in the UK, a few in Australia, but then we also have lots of team members from Asia and Europe. 
uh, and, and some of them are not as confident with their English and there's no, people are not using their video cameras because it's too early in the day. I don't want to turn on my video camera. I'm, I look ugly. It's too early. It's too late in the evening. So that's the pain with face-to-face -face virtual meetings. <clears throat> so well, what's the purpose? Well, the purpose is that by having a visual camera, I can see your facial expressions. I can, I can get more understanding of your point. And they do a little bit of relationship building. I, I can acknowledge you. So how can we adjust our meetings and our interactions to capture some of that purpose? Well, maybe for the non-native English speakers, we use a lot more chat and a lot more Slack so that they can copy paste into Google Translate and feel more confident about their written communication. And then instead of doing lots of video, we can upload information on a team wiki or at the beginning of our verbal meetings, we can just share something funny. One team I have uh, starts their daily scrum, their daily stand-up meeting with a joke. It takes two minutes in their 15-minute dial-up call. So that is one way, ladies and gentlemen, that you can pivot from the textbook. Pivot your practices to fit your context and the growth patterns. And those were the two leadership moves I wanted to share with you today to give you a little bit of a taste of this idea that when you run into a barrier, there is still more opportunity. There's more momentum. There's more untapped agility waiting for you if we just rebound past the barriers. We talked about two examples of barriers, but there are many others. And you can get some free digital bonuses from the website without even buying the book. Uh, there's some templates and there's some, uh, some information there. But that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. And uh, super uh, excited to hear your thoughts, your questions, um, anything that you might want to talk about this agile journey. So I'm going to see there, Susie. Cool. So that was super exciting talk. I need to get your uh, get your book and read it. And I have one customer. I, uh, <laughs> I said what? now I have one, now I have one customer. Oh sure, of course. You have one customer here, and <laughs> start with a question. Uh, sometimes when I speak about saying no, right? as I often do for the product owner specifically, they very often like average this culture differences. Like uh, if I speak to some Asian countries, et cetera, it's like difficult to say no. So uh, do you change your explanation differently or how do you acknowledge that different context? Yeah. Language matters, words matter. So in some cultures and some environments, uh, it's, it's inappropriate to say no forcefully. Uh, in the presentation and in the book, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit playful. I'm a little bit uh, forceful with saying no for the idea. The implementation of the idea might require that you explain your position. And we actually um, have a, a, a process uh, that's laid out in the book. It's uh, inspired by the power of a positive no which was a best-selling book where you acknowledge the request. Yes, I agree. That's a very important feature. Um, and then you explain some of the, the challenges. And the challenge is that for this request to be done first, um, we have to choose something else to defer. Um, we would love for your strategic vision to help us decide which of these items we should defer. And, and then say, uh, now, um, here's two options. Option one would be that we do some of it now, some of it later. Option two would be that we defer this. And so that's a, there's a, a three-step approach to being more diplomatic in how you, in how you say no. <clears throat> All right. Diplomacy. That's cool. Harikshan asks you how to attack a structure and culture together. 
I love the idea, but culture needs to invest in creating coaching competency. competency. So uh, how to attack structure and culture together? Yeah, the, the, that, that uh, specific move is, was actually the beginning of the book three years ago. There was an article in the, in the Cutter Consortium Journal about the, uh, the temptation to have a philosophically consistent strategy where uh, we're going to roll out a new uh, methodology, all one methodology, all consistent, and we're going to change a lot of policies, metrics, and structures. We're going to do a lot of tangible things. And then by doing that, then the culture will change. But when you do it, you meet a lot of resistance, skepticism. This will pass. It's a fad. I don't understand why we're doing this new methodology, this new framework, this new practice. And so we need to contextualize the structure. We need to add context. We need to uh, create a story, a narrative around it so that it isn't just forcing something into people. They, they can be part of a bigger picture. The opposite challenge is when we go only culture. Let's talk about our values. Let's, let's connect with each other. Let's have lots of workshops where we have sticky notes and then, and then lots of poster boards. And then we publish our values on posters and nothing sticks because we need to operationalize the culture that we want. So how are you going to implement the culture? Words are important. The narrative is important. The conversation is important. In fact, it's what was missing from that framework rollout. But sometimes when all we do is talk and no action, we miss the bigger picture. So that's what we mean by culture and structure together. We need to have the narrative and the action at the same time. If you do only one or the other because you're philosophically consistent, you might be philosophically consistent and very frustrated about people going back to their old habits. What was the most difficult challenge you need to overcome when you've been helping organizations on their agile journey? I would say, so perhaps the most important uh, gap mm -hmm. and the most common gap is not having alignment on why we are doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this is, um, this is actually the first move. The first move is stop selling, start aligning. Stop selling Agile. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to buy um, Agile. What they want to buy are results, outcomes. And so some leaders, they want Agile because they see it as a way to be faster. Mm -hmm. And other, uh, in fact, I have a, uh, there's a leadership team I'm working on right now where one, the, the head of product says Agile means faster. And the head of tech says, no, Agile means collaboration and empowerment. And they are yelling at each other and they are not agreeing. And so no amount of training is going to help right now because at a leadership level, we don't even agree what is success for this journey. So I would say that's the most common and probably the most important gap. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing if you face it, like uh, those two, people, the two groups, like yelling at each other and they don't listen and et cetera, right? So what do you do then? Well, here's, uh, we, we've done a few things. The first was to have a team conversation, the okay. entire leadership team. Let's get them in a room and say, okay, what are the most important outcomes that we need today? Because three years ago, when they started their Agile journey, it was quality. Mm -hmm. They had too many defects and they were losing customers mm -hmm. and it was a problem and, and they've made progress on that. So the outcomes for agility three years ago was improved quality. Mm -hmm. What do we need today? Because some leaders, they're like, no, we need more. We need better. Well, okay. Do we need more quality even more? Mm -hmm. Or is it time to make an adjustment? So we had that conversation and then we did a survey. If any of you have a scrum certification, you have access to comparative agility. Mm -hmm. And we did a survey there and we asked in the, in, in that survey tool, we asked uh, all of the employees, what of these outcomes have we made progress on? And the, the smallest progress was made on morale. 
empowerment. Mm -hmm. Everything, uh, good progress on productivity, good progress on, on quality. Good pro and so the leadership team said, well, I thought everyone was happy. I, th I thought they liked being here. They're, they, they're here for so many years. Um, but then the data revealed that there's more work to be done there. So number one, a conversation with all of the peers together. And then number two, data. Mm -hmm. Data can reveal where the next area is beyond somebody's opinion. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Cool. So Nicholas asked, uh, he said that, I love that some companies are shaking things by uh, eliminating roles, such as Scrum Master and Product Owner. It must have been difficult to get a consensus on implementing that. So how would you vote on that, he asked. And how long do you think it should last? People seem to really need titles. Well, <clears throat> so the rest of that story, uh, when I talked to Mike about it, Mm -hmm. He said uh, he removed the scrum master and product owner roles, but he had alternatives suggested. So uh, it's very dangerous if you remove something without having a replacement, because then you can create chaos and then people will start inventing things. And one of the key alternatives that he had for scrum masters was <clears throat> project manager. <laughs> and so... And he did that on purpose mm -hmm. because now that they had been on this agile journey and they made significant progress over two years in flattened organization teams. Now the old understanding of project manager was completely blown up. And so now he was, he was asking what, do, what does that mean <clears throat> now? And then also product manager mm -hmm. for product owner. So he had some alternatives and, and some of them were a little bit more provocative. Some were a little bit more traditional, uh, but it forced people to look beyond their title to say, what is my skill? What is it that I really enjoy doing? And for each uh, scrum master or product owner role, there were two, there were three or four options for them to choose from. And it took, it took six months, hmm. lots of conversation. And they're still evolving it and still figuring it out. <clears throat> nice. I like the flexibility of it. I actually often like those things where you can choose your own title. That's even better. Yeah. Then you have yeah, presence all around the company. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the uh, something like where you've been really proud on the progress? Some story about some company where you feel like, oh, they are going so well. And they might be lucky. That's something like super positive. Uh, something super positive. Uh, 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 I think we've we've already heard uh, from the Scrum Alliance leadership, uh, Howard Sublett and Melissa Boggs in this series, but it bears repeating. It bears repeating that the organization that's helping to drive agility is actually living out the virtues and seeing the successes of it. So for those of you who hadn't heard the story, one of the chapters in the book is where giving away the transformation might mean letting go of your role. It might mean that you're no longer the only agile champion and you may not be the agile lead. And so at the Scrum Alliance, there's no CEO. There's two people serving in the role of what would normally be a CEO. In order for them to move to the next level of agility, they had to design a role that was internally facing chief scrum master and a role that was externally facing chief product owner. And so they started using this idea of paired leadership, shared leadership, where they were giving away what would normally be considered a lot of CEO re responsibilities and CEO privileges. But Howard and Melissa have, have pioneered something very different in the corporate world with this idea and all it's done is double the number of certified coaches that the Scrum Alliance has had within the span of a year. Um, it's brought back um, more engagement from its membership than they've had. And so they're seeing real mission results as a result of let of rebounding past the barrier of uh, traditional leadership, not not having the impact that we needed it to have. 
so they're they're the one I'm super proud of of what they're doing, and they they actually are featured in the in in the book as a as a case study of what could happen if you are willing to to make momentum happen even if you don't get all the credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm super proud of them those two as well. They are wonderful role models for his agility. Which leads me to the next question. Think about yourself, maybe many years back, when you first time get in a phase with agility. Like, do you still remember that moment? And what was your biggest learning or change at yourself? So I first, so as an engineer, mm -hmm. as a software engineer, uh, my very first experience with test-driven development was without telling anybody, without asking for permission, I just started writing automated tests <clears throat> because I, I read the textbook and the textbook said, this is what I should do. I read Kent Beck's book. And so I'm doing it and I would write a test and it would be green. Oh, that was it. I want to write another test. I want to write another test. Green, green. Oh, it became like a drug. And then I would write another test and another test and another test. Green, 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 green. Oh, oh, oh. And, and then when I ran my metrics, I realized that I exceeded the number of tests that was appropriate. And so that was my barrier. My barrier as an engineer was that I was over uh, testing. I was writing too many unit tests because the rule of thumb is for every line of code, you should write well, on average one line of test code. And so I had to start learning how to be a little bit more intentional, a little bit more disciplined about when to do testing. So um, that was my first experience where I, I got a little bit of a good thing and it became too much of a good thing. And then that motivated a rebound to better performance. That's a nice story. <laughs> um, I'm looking if there are some questions. There is this long one, which I'm trying to digest now. Okay. So, it's about throwing the textbook away, right? So uh, that's uh, one of those uh, beginnings if you want to learn how to be a leader. So uh, in many cases, you just learn the theory. But uh, if I take the point in consideration that every agile journey starts at a different point, Madeline says, right? Would you say that there are some people just being able to be executives of agile processes? So the, if I can repeat the question, the question is, are there leaders that are more naturally aligned to an agile way of working? Yeah, I and would agree with that way. I would agree. And the answer is, um, is yes. Uh, the research uh, in, the, in the leadership circle, in the leadership circle um, that um, Adams and Anderson have put out, as well as the research by Bill Joyner, uh, those are the two that come to mind. Mm -hmm. The kind of uh, the kind of leadership that we want, that we look forward to, um, is is often about ten percent. Ten percent of all managers, all supervisors, uh, all um, leaders, executives, across all the titles, about ten percent already fit the agile mindset. Mm -hmm. already want to achieve both a mm -hmm. uh, good organizational results and organizational health. Mm -hmm. uh, all the other leaders are on a journey just like us and just like regular team members and individual contributors. And so that can be really important for us to remember that mm -hmm. we keep saying, you know, we need to send leaders to training so that they get it. And then when they get it, then we can be successful. But I think it's important to say that we need to move all of us forward together. And it's more credible, I think, if a leader says, I'm on this journey too. I'm rethinking my role. I'm rethinking my skill set. That's more authentic and even more powerful than saying, I am an ideal leader. Follow me. Mm -hmm. Because it might not be as achievable. I might not be able to think like that 10% leader. Um, so that's where the research is, is uh, that uh, about one out of 10 of managers, supervisors, leaders already mm -hmm. 
get that mindset, but the rest of us are on a journey. Yes, you're optimistic being here. We are all on a journey. That's cool. I love it. What is the one thing you want us to remember from today's speech? The one thing I want to remember that when you're frustrated, when you're frustrated that this agile thing is not working the way it was supposed to, I'm not seeing the results that all of these speakers were saying I would get because of this problem and this problem and this problem and this problem. Number one, you are not alone. Number two, you are not a failure. There's more around the corner. Just keep swimming. Thank you very much. And uh, we have 10 minutes break and then we continue with additional speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Thank you all. It's a pleasure. <laughs>